Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Let's Be Neighbors. This is our series for topics of community interest that we host to bring together experts that are on topics that are important to you guys. And this is a very exciting panel that we have for tonight. It's on adventures in Utah and how to have fun, fun ideas and safe practices out in the wild places of Utah. And so we have... Uh, like I said, an awesome set of panelists tonight covering everything from parks and recreation to our national parks and perhaps a unknown nature preserve just outside the valley. So let me introduce our panelists tonight. First, we have Emma Lowe, who is part of the Swainer Preserve, yeah, Swainer Nature Preserve and Eco Center. And she joined the team um, in July 2021. She graduated with a bachelor's degree in environmental and sustainability studies and international studies from the university of utah in may 2021 um, since she was young emma has had a passion for both the outdoors and visual media and she loves any opportunity to contribute to the two um, at work she find you can find her filming and photographing various events and activities and outside she might be cooking gardening crafting or exploring the natural world and then we have Josh Rooser, who works for Salt Lake County Parks and Recreation as the communication manager. His current role, um, but prior to this, he enjoyed managing the aquatics facility at Salt Lake County. Outside of work, he loves to enjoy all of that Salt Lake Valley has to offer and has learned about some many hidden gems with insider information. So top notch there. And then last but not least, we have Paula Eastman with the National Park Service at Bryce Canyon National Park. And she is joining us to, oh, she's also, by the way, she's also a senior park ranger, um, which is, she's been there as one of the longest standing uh, rangers in that position and throughout different places within the National Park Service. So she is well-versed with many different things and can tell us how to have awesome adventures and to do it safely. So without further ado, we will turn the time straight over to Emma and we will go from there. So welcome and let's be neighbors. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, again, my name's Emma. I'm the office manager over at Swanner Preserve and Eco Center. Let me just share that screen so everyone can see what I'm uh, doing over here. Um, so yeah, Swanner Preserve and Eco Center, we are a nature preserve and nature museum located just off the I-80, um, off the Kimball Junction on your way into Park City. So from Salt Lake City itself, it's only about a 25, 30 minute drive. Um, I actually live in Salt Lake City, so I'm pretty familiar with the drive. Um, and I had no clue it existed until I applied to work here. Um, and I'm so glad I found out about it because it truly is a hidden gem. Um, there's lots to do all around the preserve and also within the Eco Center. Um, so let's just get started. Um, so our mission over at Swanner is to preserve the land and the human connection to the natural landscape, educate the local and broader communities about the value of nature, nurture both the ecosystem and the people connected with it. Um, and as I go through our programming and some of our conservation efforts tonight, I hope you'll be able to see that um, we definitely try to put our mission to preserve, educate, and nurture throughout everything we do. It's definitely, um, those are our top values. So um, just to give you a little history about Swanner, um, I'd like to start off with a land acknowledgement. So I'd like to recognize that Swanner Preserve and Eco Center resides on the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the north northwestern band of Sersoni and the Ute Indian tribe. In offering this land acknowledgement, um, we have we affirm indigenous sovereignty, history, and experiences. Um, and uh, before and after um, European contact, um, the Swanner land that exists now has been alpine wetlands. Um, and they were frequented by the Nuchu, otherwise known as Ute and Eastern Shoshone tribes during warmer months for resources like waterfowl, plants, large game, and other supplies. Um, fast forwarding um, quite a bit forward, um, in a, uh, around 1957 is when Leland S. Swanner purchased Spring Creek Ranch, um, which is where Swanner Preserve is now. So he operated that for 35 years. Um, and when he passed away in 1993, his family wanted to recognize him uh, by uh, creating a, uh, still keeping the open space that he had fostered. Um, so they donated 190 acres of his land in memory of him, um, and that was known as the Swanner Memorial Park Foundation. So that was the very start of Swanner back in 1993. Um, between then and the early 2000s, we 
gained and gained um, more land parcels, which eventually added up to 1,200 acres of preserved uh, land that is permanently protected by conservation easements. Um, and then fast forwarding again a little bit, in 2008, our eco center was built and it opened. Um, and two years after that, we uh, donated ourselves to Utah State University and we operate as one of their extension offices. Um, and so the preserve today, as I mentioned, it's 1,200 acres. Um, you'll see this map on the right side of my screen. Um, and that road going through it is the I-80. So on the north side of the I-80, we have um, our sageland habitat. And you'll see a bunch of these dots going through the preserve. Those are trails. And so those are open to the public all day, every day, um, and a really great way to experience the preserve on your own time. Bring your friends. They're single track trails, great for biking, hiking, or having your dogs on leash. You can see some of the creeks going through the preserve and get a nice view if you go to one of the top points of these hikes. Um, and then on the south side of the preserve, this is actually closed to the public for the most part. Um, unless you're volunteering with us or anything like that. Um, but this is the wetland side of the preserve. So the uh, ecosystem's a little bit different over here, a lot more marshy and the plants are a bit different. Um, and all across the preserve, you'll see all kinds of wildlife. Um, this is a great spot to see some migratory birds. Um, our unofficial mascot is the Sandhill Crane and they are still here in Utah. Um, so you could come up to the preserve until about September 25th, that's usually when they start migrating south um, to try and spot those. And there's a bunch of other amazing birds as well um, and all kinds of other um, wildlife like moose and elk and beavers and all those amazing creatures. So that is the preserve. Now more on the inside, we have the eco center. So we are open Wednesday through Sunday, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. We are free to the public, which I think is great. Um, and then our special exhibits are ticketed. So uh, those are not free, but you can still explore other parts of the eco center for free during those exhibits. Um, it, is a, it is a 10,000 square foot LEED certified building. LEED uh, stands for Leader in Energy and Environmental Design. So this building was constructed sus with sustainable sources um, and it runs very efficiently. Like we collect our own rainwater for irrigation um, and a few other things that make this building awesome. Uh, within the building, we have our exhibit hall. Uh, right now on display is our Why Wetlands exhibit. So it's a permanent display that we have um, and it just uh, tells you about the wonders of wetlands and why they're so crucial to a desert state like Utah. Um, and then we have our back deck and pier to explore, which is one of my favorite parts uh, of the eco center to feel like you're on the preserve, um, but you're still within the boardwalk and you can take a pair of binoculars out there to see if you can find uh, any birds or anything out there. And we do lend out binoculars to the general public um, that come in with no charge. Um, we also have our observation tower, which is about five stories high, and it gives you a nice panoramic view of the preserve. You can either take the elevator or the stairs. Um, if you're taking the stairs, then you'll definitely get a bit of cardio in. Um, and then we have our naturalist reading room, and that's a great place for the kiddos to play a bunch of nature games. And we have a selection of nature-themed books um, for kids to read. Um, and a couch and everything to look out the window, look at the preserve and kind of just relax. Um, we also have a gift shop with local and sustainable finds. So that's a great place to take maybe any folks out of town if you're wanting some like Utah um, souvenirs or anything like that, or even just do some birthday or Christmas shopping. Um, and then outside of the eco center, we have a demonstration garden when you're walking in that has a bunch of native and water wise plants and some signage telling you about uh, why we selected those plants and why they're great for the pollinators around us. Uh, we have a wetland discovery trail that actually lets you go onto the southern section of the preserve that's usually co close to the public, but during open hours you can come get a key from us and a guide and you can do a self-guided tour. It's about a mile total, so that's a really fun way to get out and experience uh, the preserve that way. We, has, we also have geocaching, and most of that's on the north side of the preserve. Um, so you can come to us and we'll let you know uh, the rundown for the geocaching. And then we have weekly nature programs. We have a nature discussion every Friday at 2 p.m. called our Swan or Shorts. On Saturdays at 8.30, we have our nature walks, which are a really, really awesome way to get out on the preserve. Um, 
and you can explore with one of our naturalists. They'll guide the walk and they'll tell you everything there is to know about uh, what's going on on the preserve during that time. Then we also have a weekly Sunday craft, which is usually a nature themed craft and oftentimes upcycled. So that's also a fun thing to do on Sundays between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. Um, coming up, we have an exhibit called Soar with Bats, and I'm really excited for this one. So it opens on October 1st, which is a Saturday, and it runs until January 8th. Um, and so this will feature, this will just talk about how bats have influenced history, folklore, pop culture, all of that fun stuff. And we'll also be featuring live bats within the um, exhibit. They'll be in an enclosure. Um, and I believe they'll be straw colored fruit bats. And so they're a mega bat species and they're actually pretty cute. And so this will be a great way to come learn about uh, everything bats do for our environment. They do so much for ecosystems across the globe. They're definitely an important species to have around um, and we're happy to have bats. And so anyways, we'd love to see any of you come up to Swanner to see this exhibit. You can see our ticketing over here. Um, and then moving on to our conservation efforts, um, we are doing our best every year, every day to make the preserve as great as it can be. Um, since it was originally ag land, agricultural land, we are, since we've, you know, had the preserve, we've done uh, a lot of things to bring it back to its wetland qualities. Um, so it's a nice habitat for insects and birds and other animals. Um, so our biggest project by far is invasive weed management. Um, and so every year we do a ton of mechanical removal. So just hand pulling weeds or chopping off um, the musk thistle heads. Um, so uh, we always have a bunch of volunteer events for that. And that's also a fun way to see parts of the preserve that are close to the public. Um, and then we have some weeds that are not as easy to remove by hand because their roots are so deep. Um, and so we do have some herbicide application across the preserve. And then we also release biocontrols. Um, of I think about once a year, and these are insects that target the invasive weeds and help us manage the weeds. Um, not only are we trying to get rid of invasive weeds, we're trying to introduce native vegetation. So we do a native uh, seeding every fall, um, and uh, we also do willow plantings and tree plantings throughout the year, usually earlier in the year, like the spring for those. Um, we love the willows because they regenerate very quickly. Um, and they're a great food source for beavers, which brings me to our next topic, stream restoration. Um, this is a project that we've been working on in the fall. Um, we've been building beaver dam analogs on the preserve for the past, um, about uh, I think about five or six years. Um, anyways, beaver dam analogs are human-made stream restoration structures. So they're essentially beaver dams made by humans. Um, and they're supposed to mimic the ecological benefits that beaver dams bring. So they keep the water within the ecosystem. They help recharge the water table. Um, and it also lowers the water temperature, which is crucial for native um, fish species. So there's, a, so there's a lot of benefits to having beaver dam analogs built. Last year we built 88 and that was a lot. And this year we're repairing some of them on the preserve. Um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, and then we also do wildlife habitat enhancement. Uh, we have bird boxes throughout the preserve and we clean them every spring so they're ready for the next bird family to come by. And we've been doing some kestrel monitoring with Hawkwatch um, as well. So lots of fun things there. Um, but uh, to focus on our volunteering, um, this is a great way to see the preserve and really make, uh, make it feel like you've made your impact. Um, so this Thursday, we'll have a beaver dam analog repair that's open to the public to come to, as well as Friday, um, September 30th. And so you'll just go onto our website. You'll find the banner that looks like this. Click on it. It'll be on the front page. And there's details and registration there for that. Um, and so we'll provide muck boots and waders, and you're able to get into the stream with us and just uh, act like a beaver and start putting biomaterial into these um, uh, beaver dam analogs. So very fun way. Uh, to spend your Thursday or Friday, in my opinion. Um, and then we also have a pollinator planning next week. We are planning about 500 seedlings of uh, plants that are great for pollinators, like milkweed. Um, and so that'll be Wednesday, September 21st, 3 to 6 p.m. Um, you'll register through the same link here. Um, and that's also another great way to see the preserve. 
Um, so not only are we doing conservation efforts and exhibits, but we also have other forms of environmental education. So we do it for all ages um, and to focus on our little ones for now. Um, we have quite the uh, extensive youth education uh, programs. So uh, one of the first ones that we have coming up soon is the Little Naturalist Storytime. So this is the perfect program for three to five year olds who are curious about their surrounding environment. Um, so they come to this story time. It's a specially selected book that um, relates to the theme that we have. And then they'll also do a craft um, that's related to the theme. And then they'll get to go out and investigate the preserve to see what's going on. Um, so that's a really cute program. It's twice a month on Fridays, uh, 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. And I believe it's $4 per um, youth participant. Um, and then our youth education team also hosts field trips here at Swanner. So if you know a teacher or if you are a teacher and you're looking for fun ways to get out of the classroom, I would recommend uh, reaching out to our education director about hosting a field trip here. Um, they'll usually take the kids out on the preserve and sometimes when we have an exhibit, they'll take them through the exhibit and that's just a really neat way to uh, get kids engaged with nature. Um, if you're not able to visit Swanner, then our education team can come to you with classroom visits, which I think is really neat. So based on availability, they'll come down to your classroom and provide a STEM lesson and talk about wetlands and the science behind it. Um, then we have our after school program during the academic year for K through five, our eco club for middle schoolers to get them engaged with nature. Then we have our summer camps, which is our biggest program um, by far. And it's a very exciting time at the eco center when all the kids are running around for summer camps. Uh, moving on to adult education, we provide walks, talks, and workshops for adults um, throughout the whole entire year. Um, we've done a lot of fun things, whether it's taking a walk out on the preserve um, and talking about a particular subject. Um, we did a nature trivia event at a Park City brewery recently, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, we've done workshops uh, like natural dye workshops. We had some of our participants there pull some dyer's woad um, which is an invasive species, and then they used it to create dye for cloths and things like that. Um, so some of the ones we have upcoming are, um, uh, first is the Wildfire and Local Landscapes, which is on th uh, Tuesday, September 20th. Um, that one will be great. It'll be talking about how we can adapt with uh, the fire seasons we've been having with the intense fire seasons. And we'll have three panelists there that will, ju they're just amazing, you know so much about fire ecology. Um, and so that's actually a hybrid event. So you can either come to Swanner for that one or you can sign up online and just view it virtually kind of like this. Um, and so I'd recommend checking that out. We also have a mindful meander two days later on September 22nd where a mindfulness expert um, will be coming out on the preserve with us along with one of our naturalists um, to do a mindful meander to connect with nature and practice mindfulness. Um, and I think that one's gonna be really exciting. Um, and then fast forwarding to November, we're gonna have one called Witnessing Great Salt Lake where we'll have two uh, professionals uh, who work with the Great Salt Lake frequently um, take us on a walk um, starting, well, it'll be at Antelope Island State Park and then we'll walk to the shoreline and we'll talk about the state of the Great Salt Lake um, what we can do to try and save it and why it's such an important resource for us to uh, keep around. Um, and lastly, I'd like to prompt you all to get involved with Swanner. So you can do that by joining as a member. Um, this is something you would renew annually. Um, and so our prices are there. Uh, members get awesome discounts on our walks, talks, and workshops, and they get free tickets to um, our exhibits and a few other perks like discounts on our gift shop. Um, you can just donate to support Swanner. Um, you can come out and volunteer and feel like you're making an impact that way. Um, you can participate in any of our upcoming events. You can sign up for our monthly newsletter to get a breakdown of what's going on. Uh, I'd like all of you to try and visit Soar with Bats, which will be an awesome uh, exhibit starting on October 1st. And then you can also follow us on Instagram and Facebook if you'd like at Swanner Preserve. Um, and thank you everybody so much for your time and listening to me uh, talk about Swanner. Um, and I hope you all um, find some time to uh, go out into nature and explore some of these fun options that we're talking about tonight. Thank you so much, Emma. And thank you for helping us discover more about that hidden gem, which I had no idea about <laughs> until we 
invited you to play with us. So thank you so much. And there is a lot. And I love the fact that bats would be just perfect for Halloween too. So I don't know if you did that on purpose, but it's it, it fits very well. And so um, we will move straight on into our next presenter, Josh Rooser with Salt Lake County Parks and Rec. And he's promised some wonderful tips, tricks, and tidbits of Salt Lake County where we live. So take it away, Josh. All right, I'm excited to be here and share uh, what I love, which is parks and recreation. They say that if you do what you love, you never work a day in your life. I don't believe it, <laughs> um, but I, I enjoy where I work, um, but mostly I enjoy getting out and participating in parks and recreation on my own. Um, let me share my screen really quick. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about some Salt Lake County parks and recreation hidden gems. Um, as mentioned before, I got my start in aquatics, so I worked uh, in pools for the last 10 years. But along the way, I've been able to participate outside of work uh, in, in learning about the many offerings that we have with Salt Lake County. Salt Lake County operates uh, several parks, hundreds of parks, actually. So we have different kinds of parks. We have regional parks, class one and class two. A class one regional park is gonna be like a big cottonwood, which we see here. Um, we have neighborhood, smaller class two parks, um, neighborhood parks, which are uh, what they sound like, just small neighborhood parks. Maybe there's a swing set within the park. And then we have recreation center parks, something like a Northwest Recreation Center there's gonna be a park next to the recreation center. Um, so lots of different ways to get out there. The great thing about Salt Lake County having so many parks is they're spread throughout the county. So whether it's a city park you're going to or a county park you're going to, there's something close by where you can get out and just enjoy nature within the park. Um, I took this picture last May, I believe it was. Um, there was, this is a big Cottonwood Regional Park, uh, this beautiful park surrounded by city. There's a disc golf course just around the corner, a recreation center close by, and a, a community garden. We operate community gardens in some of our parks as well. And I got to spend some time just sitting here listening to the birds. There was a, a marshy area right here. Um, at many of our parks, we also have rentals available. We have pavilion rentals. And if you go to our parks operations center, which is uh, just out in West Jordan, right near the airport, we have rentals. So you can rent uh, volleyballs, horseshoes, uh, different things that you might use in the park. We also operate hundreds of miles of open space and trails. This is a picture from Dimpledale Park. This is the largest park that Salt Lake County operates. It's kind of like our central park, the central park of Salt Lake County. Then uh, Dimpledale Park is 630 acres. So you could spend all day in the park and still not see everything that it has to offer. There are lots of uh, equestrian trails and there are mountain bike trails. There's a, a uh, an old house that is going to be restored on the east side of the park um, and it's just a beautiful park Our, we have uh, parks crews who are there who see lots of wildlife lots of deer um, they mentioned that there was even a cougar that made an appearance several times in the park this year so there's there's lots of great opportunities to explore right here in the valley with this this amazing undeveloped large regional park we are also working on brand new hiking trails on the west side of the valley when people think about hiking through the wasatch range you know it, through salt lake county it's all it's all along the wasatch range and salt lake county just acquired some land and uh, are working with some partners over by the copper mine working with uh, the department of natural resources and kinnicott copper to develop Yellow Fork trails. Those are under development as we speak. And by the end of next year, we're going to have hiking trails on the west side for many of our west side residents to enjoy without having to um, go over to the, the Wasatch Range. So lots of opportunities coming this way. And um, the Jordan River Trail is a, a beautiful trail that's paved all along the Jordan River, tra uh, Jordan River 
Jordan River. Um, and Salt Lake County is working with several partners to help make the river more accessible. When we talked about safety when it comes to water, uh, that's something that's really important to me. So uh, a couple of safety things to keep in mind when going in near or around water. Drowning is the leading cause of accidental death for kids ages two to five. So you wanna make sure that wherever there's water around, if there are little ones that there's someone supervising and has, has, has responsibility for watching that, that child 100% of the time, no distractions. Um, but yeah, the, the Jordan River Trail is becoming more accessible. We recently uh, put in several boat ramps along the trail. We're working on developing the river to, to be more natural. We've put in some different landscapes within the river that, that make it flow more naturally. So even within Salt Lake County, right down the middle, we've got this beautiful opportunity, this hidden gem um, with a trail that extends from the north end to the south end of the valley. If you've never ridden the trail or walked the trail, this is a, a great way to get out and see a riparian habitat uh, firsthand. I've, I've, um, I'm excited to check out the, the nature center that was just talked about because I too enjoy birding. Um, and I've seen several um, cool birds along the Jordan River Trail. I saw Kingfisher. Kingfisher was my latest treasure that I found there. Um, and then Mill Creek Canyon is also a trail area that Salt Lake County operates. Uh, there is a fee associated with it. It's, I believe, $5 per day for cars. There's, there's annual passes and monthly passes uh, available as well. That's also a place where dogs can go off leash on even numbered days. So that's a, a great uh, hidden gem for those dog owners who, who like to give their dogs a little bit of room to run around as well. If you don't like dogs, um, also be aware that on even number of days, dogs can be off leash. Mill Creek Canyon has several picnic sites that can also be rented through our parks department. Uh, I actually just rented one last weekend and went on a picnic with some friends, did a, a nice little barbecue up there and enjoyed some time out in nature. Just, you know, 20 minute drive away. Um, people really love it biking Mill Creek Canyon as well, and that connects to some other trails, the Parley Trail, which is actually getting a, a completed east to west connection from the Jordan River Trail to the Bonneville Shoreline Trail, which Salt Lake County also maintains. Um, and that, that completion is going on near uh, 21st South, where there's a lot of, where we have that spaghetti bowl, so it's going to be um, an a trail above above land with bridges to get you from one end to the other without having to worry about crossing dangerous roads. Um, so lots of different ways to enjoy open space and trails. Um, gardens are another part of our open space programs, and all of that is found on our Salt Lake County website, which I'll go over at the end. One of our most treasured hidden gems in Salt Lake County is Wheeler Historic Farm. It's an actual operating farm um, that was acquired from the Wheeler family and, and renovated. We've got a great activity barn. One of our newest additions is an outdoor education center that's operated in conjunction with the USU Extension. Um, also at the farm, we also just this week opened Milo and Friends, which is a partnership with Utah State STEM and it's a great way to teach young ones about math. Um, there are several signs in English and Spanish throughout the park as you walk around that help uh, preschool age children two to five years old start learning the basics of math. The, uh, the people who put it in mentioned that having that basic understanding can really give someone a head start and determine future academic success just knowing some really basic math skills. I walked around and, and uh, made sure that I was up to date on my math skills as well. There's, there's animals that can be seen, there are animals that can be pet, there's activities throughout the farm, wagon rides, and they're looking forward to putting on pumpkin days 
with different activities throughout the park uh, that's coming up here in October. The Outdoor Education Center hosts several um, educational events. There's there's great ways to learn about nature and how to get outside safely. So that's an, another thing. Getting outside and hiking and starting camping or or whatever outside activities you want to do, it's it's nice to make sure that you're going out safely, that you have the tools that you need to do so. So that's one of the things that our Outdoor Education Center puts on with outdoor programs. We have a free hiking program that is available for those who might never have hiked before and want to get out and, and try hiking in a safe environment with um, some, some guided leaders who can talk about the, the different ways to stay safe on hikes. Of course, we always recommend going in pairs. It's always smart to go with a buddy where, whenever you get outside um, just to make sure everyone's safe. Some other outdoor programs that we've had uh, are some books in the park that's coming up. We've got a, a group that meets to read books and it's a partnership with the library and, and discuss those. And one of the ones that recently sold out was a foraging class where one of our outdoor program coordinators took participants up in the Mill Creek Canyon and looked at different berries and uh, things that can be eaten and foraged out just right here in our backyard. Our golf uh, courses are not just for golf. A lot of people come in the evenings. It's best not to come during the day, but come in the evenings and walk the trails and enjoy the, the greenery that the golf courses offer. We also have foxes that frequent our golf courses. Um, there's a family of foxes that actually lives at Big Cottonwood Regional Park as well. County operates uh, two disc golf courses, one at Creekside and one at Taylorsville. Um, and yeah, our, go our golf courses are, are great, not just for golf, but uh, again, outside of golfing hours to walk around. And last but not least, our recreation centers. Um, this is a picture that was taken during COVID. The owls, we, this was at North, uh, where was this? Fairmont Aquatic Center. And with people not visiting the pools, the, the owls, we had a, a group of great horned owls that came by and paid us a visit from time to time. Um, and just even walking around that park, it's a city park, but you know, still a great park. There's a uh, pond there and, and great bird watching and a great way to enjoy nature right there within the city. Our recreation centers offer health and fitness classes trainings, pools, uh, swimming. Our junior jazz season is coming up. It's a partnership with the jazz where kids learn the basics of basketball and, and the jazz really help us put on a good program there. Um, so lots of different ways to stay healthy, active, and engaged with the outdoors in a safe way, uh, whether you're doing it with, through the recreation center or on your own, lots of different ways. You can follow us on our socials, SLCO, Parks and Recreation. Since starting uh, my job now as communications manager, I'm going to be getting out more often and checking out all these places and sharing them on our socials. My boss gave me the hashtag Wreck It Rooster, um, so you can follow along and see what uh, hidden gems we can find next. You can find all the information about our parks and recreation centers at slco.org slash parks recreation. turn the time back over thank you so much josh and there were actually a lot of gems that i didn't even know about and i so thank you so much and awesome i love how many things there are so close whether it's swanner or any of the local parks that are just down the street to like i said dimple dell um sounds amazing i love that it's you're calling it the central park of of salt lake valley and so now we're going to expand our vision a little bit bigger to the National Park Service. And, you know, we are, is in Utah, we are very well known for the Mighty Five and many state uh, parks. And just, we have some beautiful wild country. And so we have the very esteemed Apollo Eastman to tell us all about it, what it's like as a park ranger and a lot more hidden gems than you may know about just what it's like to be a park ranger and 
how to stay safe when you get to beyond the park, but to the the wild, wild places of Utah. So I will turn the time over straight away to Paula. We can't hear you yet, so you'll have to unmute. <laughs> Well, hello, everyone. I'm so happy to be here and I love hearing about all of the things that are close to home here. And I unfortunately don't get enough time to be out in our state parks, but when I do get to see any of the state parks, I'm always uh, enthused and excited and enchanted by the beauty here that that we have in Utah. So my name is Ranger Paula and I am a a long-term ranger here, meaning I live in the park. In fact, currently I'm sitting here in one of the historical buildings and I stay in the park 24 hours a day, seven days a week, although I do get a couple days off here and there. So we are always available, always on call for emergencies. But I put together a couple things that I, I, I thought might be interesting uh, for, for you folks these are typical questions that we get for rangers and often we don't have a chance to really think about it because we'll be on topic of whatever resources we are at the time. But I love to talk about being a ranger because I never thought that I would be one. Being a ranger is actually considered one of the more dangerous jobs. Uh, so we mitigate that by planning ahead, by by knowing our terrain and by having the resources that we need. So let me tell you a little bit about the national parks. Um, the Organic Act was really the catalyst for beginning the national parks. And I wanna read to you what the uh, original, the original mi mission, station, mission statement was, and it's the National Park Service preserves unimpaired the natural and cultural resources and values of the Na National Park Serve system for the enjoyment, education, and inspiration of this and future generations. The Park Service cooperates with partners to extend the benefits of natural, cultural resources, conservation, outdoor recreation throughout this country and the world. So, one of the things I want to focus on here is a lot of people compare the National Park Service to the other land management uh, parts of the of the government. And I just want to give you a little bit background on that is the National Forest Service protects uh, our forest. So it they take care of like our trees and and a lot of the natural resources where the parks has a, a little bit a different mission. Uh, that's broad. It's a more broad uh, focus. So I want to kind of touch on that. A lot of things that people don't give thought to that we protect every day. So one of the most important things of protecting here at the park are our people. So we we spend a lot of time uh, doing search and rescues, everything from broken legs on up. Uh, one of the key things here is actually elevation and dehydration because we are 8,000 to 9,000 feet. And our biggest threat is lightning. So the, the largest part of our job is protecting the people. The next are the resources. So that are, that's cultural as well as natural resources. So here at the National Park and all over the United States, our focus is on the plants, the animals, the birds, and our snakes. So we spend a lot of time either repositioning people so we can protect the animals or the people from whatever might be the threat. And I'll give you an example. So snakes are a big part of the National Park and we, we need them. And unfortunately, people feed our squirrels and our chipmunks. So this time of year before all of the snakes are going to get warm and go undercover, they're gonna go after those, those, those chipmunks and those squirrels. So typically that's where the people are because they're feeding them. And then we have a problem with our rattlesnakes near people. We love our rattlesnakes and we need our rattlesnakes and we love that people get to see them. But the most important thing is that we, we keep people safe from that. So the, that's one of our natural resources, but we have many, we have the, the protected uh, prairie dogs, we have 
bears, we have mountain lions, we have mule deer, we have badgers, we have so, so many animals here. And I'm here to tell you that we're doing a great job of that. At Bryce Canyon specifically, we take bear protection really serious. And the way that we handle that is when we have people going out in the wind into the wilderness, if they're spending the night, a couple nights out there or hiking out there, we enforce uh, hard shelled canisters so that people can put anything in there that has a fragrance to it. So that could be, of course, food. It could be, be toothpaste, it could be sunscreen, it could be chapstick for your, for your uh, lips out there. But we're really strict about that so that we can take care of the bears. Is once the bears realize that the humans have something, then that becomes a nuisance, meaning that they interact with humans and, and that isn't safe. And then our mountain lions, same thing. So we, we try to teach people on how to handle the mountain lions. They want nothing to do with us mostly, but but to remain in the predator instead of putting yourself in the prey mode. So what I mean by that is by, if you do come across a mountain lion, is that you don't turn your back on them, you don't run, but you stare at them like eye to eye, not threatening and just step back. For the most part, they'll go on their way as well as the bears do. They don't really want much to do with us. So the next thing are, is our in our natural resources are our rock formation. So taking care of the landscape here, particularly at Bryce, is we're known for our hoodoos. And our hoodoos are rock formations that were formed over millions of years and now have been eroding and have created these beautiful, fantastic, just incredibly gorgeous rock formations that are easy accessible, the most beautiful or the largest amount of hoodoos in the world that are that are just filled with color. Protecting them is a part of our job too, because a lot of people want to climb on them uh, or they don't they don't realize that staying on the trail is really to protect not just them, but to to, to also protect our resources. And then our vegetation. So we put a lot of effort into reminding people kindly to keep their feet again on the trails so that they don't squish down all the plants. So for all our birders, that's really important because particularly on a high plateau in a park like ours, our birds like the Paragon Falcon will come in or an eagle, uh, any of the birds, and they're looking for something, berries, food all along the rim, once the vegetation is destroyed, um, we don't we don't get to see them again in that area. Typically, they'll move on to more vegetated areas. So we protect the animals by protecting the vegetation. And then the other thing that most people don't really give much thought to in the national parks is the soundscape. Protecting the soundscape is really a moving target for us, and we would love to partner with everyone that would be interested in that, but protecting the sound so that when you come to visit, when people come to visit, they can experience the, the outdoors, meaning the sounds of the birds, the sound of the winds coming over the hoodoos or up and through uh, our vegetation and our trees. And protecting that is uh, an ongoing challenge for us with all the new things that are out there, um, everything from drones. And drones are a problem for us because not only is the sound distracting to uh, our visitors, but also they're dangerous uh, if they fail. Uh, they do kill wildlife and they have crashed. So taking, educating people so that they know that that, that wouldn't be a good choice in the park for the safety of, of people and for our animals. I, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is our view shed. So the National Park Service all over the United States, it's a combination of things is the sound and how you can see over the landscape that's yours. So the National Park Service is everyone's park. Every citizen is invested and is part of the national park. 
So when we say the visual shed, what we're protecting is visibility in air quality. And I get some great news on that. I check the air quality frequently. We, we're on a schedule. We Every week we have uh, certain instruments that we, we check that the measurements are digitally sent to different parts in the United States, re research centers, uh, private industry, government entities that look at what our air quality, and the good news is, is our air quality has actually improved um, over time because we're partnering with local people and we're working together to create solutions. So the view shed is really important. Uh, this is going to be an odd thing, but Although our view shed has increased on days when things aren't so good, so there may be an event that's triggered poor visibility and air quality, that has declined. So we're working with our partners to improve that. So a day in a life in a ranger. So I'll tell you a little about that. First and foremost is I never, I hadn't even thought about being a ranger in all of us here at the park have come from different directions. We've got into the national park with a variety of disciplines, and that's what makes us so dynamic. Is the our park rangers are made up of people that studies have studied zoology, have degrees in paleontology, archaeology, uh, geology, and a whole bunch of other ologies. And we love to sit at a table and and discuss things. If we find a discrepancy, we have a healthy discussion and we find solutions or we teach each other. As a park ranger, every year I get to work with new professors that come in, new interns, and that keeps us in the field fresh on all the newest information, what the people coming out of college are learning and what our professors are teaching. So that's a really cool thing. But a park ranger is a mixture of things, and I want to share what that is. Like I said, we all have different backgrounds. We have a department that's called resource management, and these folks have an incredibly busy job. They do everything from LIDAR, which measures the erosion rate in a park. They do um, hydrology, so they, they sample the water. They do paleontology, so they, they look at the fossils and compare what we've had before, what we have now, and whatever the newest technology is so that we can make sure that the information that we use to teach people is still uh, correct and current because that's one of the, the, the other missions is to educate other people so that the visitors can also take care of their national park. But the resource management, one of the, the hydrology pieces that are, I found most interesting this year, being out there and studying alongside the, the hydrologist, is that we have surface water and seep water in springs. So we have current history with water that matches up that's been un, in the earth for over a thousand years. So the ones that come through the earth over a thousand years, we get a fingerprint from that water sample of where it was. And we can also tell what historic events, if there was an, an, an incident, that air quality was impact. So we can see those things when we measure them. And that's done through our resource management department. We have maintenance. Without maintenance, the national parks uh, wouldn't have the building and utilities. So they do everything from structural uh, care as well as taking care of the restrooms. And then we have roads and tra roads and trails. Those trails people work hard. They go down, they carry large instruments and the instruments that they use are not impactful, in other words, not high vibrating, so that can disrupt the geology or impact our animals. So all of the work that we do here, we do by hand with the least invasive equipment we can. And sometimes we take all of the ranges from all of the departments to help. We have law enforcement. So our law enforcement here at the park do a lot of search and rescue. Uh, they work in our campgrounds to monitor that and also with the traffic and for any incidents that are out there. And they back up the frontline uh, rangers, which would be me. And so I am an interpretive ranger. And that means I have a diverse role here at the park. And that means it's my responsibility to work with the paleontologist, with the geologist, with the hydro hy 
hydrology folks in all of resource management and then learn it. So as a park ranger, the most impactful part for us as being ranger, rangers is learning because it's our job to learn it, to get it right, to articulate it so that we can pass it forward to you. And, and that's the favorite, my favorite part about the job. The uh, law enforcement and the PSAR folks, those are the, the search and rescue that are out there hiking the trails work with us tandemly. So when we have to um, assist somebody either with an accident and the severity can be from a twisted ankle, dehydration, all the way up. We, we see everything here at the park. We all pitch in. So if we're teaching and they need our help somewhere or we're on site when something happens, our role changes real quick quickly and uh, we're so happy that we can be there and help people or just help assist them uh, when they might be afraid of something. Uh, the other folks that we have here that work alongside of the park ranges, interpretive, so that would be me, are fees. The fees folks are the folks that meet you at the gate and uh, with that smile and hand you the map. They take care of our campgrounds and they also do uh, checking on horses. So in this park and other parks in the United States, people are allowed with a permit to come into the park. Then we have administration. We have an, an entire administration department and they handle our budget, um, concessions, permits, and then human resource issues, and then housing. So being a park ranger can be anything that anyone wants to be. So if there is a dream to be a park ranger, someone wants to be a park ranger, whatever your skill sets are, the National Park Service has a match for that. So that brings me to me personally. So as a park ranger, as a senior park ranger, I told you that it was a complete uh, gift to be a park ranger and I'm thrilled to be here. This has been the most exciting and the most rewarding job. But I can also tell you with certainty, it is also the hardest. So this job requires uh, a lot of physical uh, ability, uh, a lot of uh, patience, and a lot of um, research uh, every day. So if that's what you're interested in and you want to be a park ranger, there's a place for you. And our geologists and all of the other scientists, even um, our meteorologist, our climatologist, all of them are really important component of us. So let's talk about some of the programs that we have here. So one of the key programs that uh, my colleagues asked me to, to share with you is the Kids, Kids Outdoors. So if you don't know anything about, or you haven't heard of the Kids Outdoors, you can go to the nps.gov website and there's a search engine and put in there every kid outdoors. So what, what that is, is a, it's a fourth grade uh, opportunity where fourth graders go online and they take like an online course. Then they print out a certification. They bring that certification to the parks. We issue them a plastic card, which is a year pass. So from September 1st to October 31st, where they can come to the national parks, they can bring their families to the national parks. And the purpose of that is it's a great way to get people out to do healthy things. So out in the fresh air and exercising and also education. So they'll learn more things and hopefully teach others and then to have fun and to enjoy each other. So one of the other fun facts that uh, my supervisor actually asked me to share with you guys is um, the Mighty Five. So Utah, Utah is phenomenal with the national parks. So the Mighty Five is what we hear all the time, but a little fun fact, um, maybe some of you know, so I'll give you a second to think about it. If anyone knows how many national parks in Utah, um, I'd love to hear that at the end but I'll hold off on that answer in the meantime. So, so stay tuned for that. So there's more than five. Um, and then another program I wanna tell you about is the Bark Ranger program. So I'm the ranger that wrote that program for Bryce Canyon National Park. And the 
Bark Ranger program is a program that is to educate people on bringing their dogs to the national parks. So unlike a lot of the state parks and a lot of the Bureau of Land Management parks and in uh, Forest Service, the national parks, because it's our mission to protect the natural resources here and not disturb them, is that we do have some safety precautions in. And Bark Ranger stands for an acronym. It's an acronym, which is bag, bag your pet's waste. People are always surprised when I tell them that, of course, any responsible uh, pet owner would do that. But the reason that we do that is because it impacts the wildlife. It can change where they normally travel. It can pass diseases back and forth. And then we have a leash, a six foot leash, leash um, a law in the park. And that's so that we keep the, the dogs within a certain range of not impacting the vegetation. And then also, so the dogs don't get hurt or impact a visitor's experience. Although some people um, love their dog and wants wants to have them, every want to have them everywhere with them. Some people are terrified, so respecting others by keeping them on leash, and also the wildlife. So respect, and then know where you can go, and know where you can go is a, I. We all want people to be able to to experience the outdoors the way they want to experience. And if that means bringing their dog, then I hope that everyone jumps on board for the Bark Ranger. If they know where they can go, then they won't ruin it for others that want to bring a pet. And that means any place that doesn't have the no dogs and it's a paved surface and that it is uh, an area like a parking lot where uh, they can stay a distance from somewhere, someone else. So know where you can go, any place that's paved, any place that uh, it's a secure area where the dog can't get away. There's a, Bryce Canyon is a fantastic place to leave, a, to bring a dog. And there are many throughout the country that you can actually bring your pet. So if you have a dog, come to Bryce. I'll be happy to swear you in as a bark ranger and you get to do all the bragging rights in your dog and you can be a role model for others so all of us pet lovers can continue to bring our dogs but before uh, i finish up i don't not sure how much more time i have i do want to talk about the leave no trace so what is leave no trace we hear that a lot when we're going to recreate the leave no trace is the principles it's principles of recreating out in the outdoors safely respectfully in saving the environment so that future generations can enjoy it. So the leave no, no, no trace is also an important thing for the visitor when they come. It keeps them safe, but it also prepares them and gives them the information so that they can plan whatever hikes you want to do or whatever things you want to see while you're here, park ranger programs uh, while you're here. So the the principles are this, is plan ahead and prepare. So do your homework. You can go online to the National Park Service, and then you can do a forward slash and then the park you wanna see. So if it was Zion, it would be Zion. Uh, travel and camp on durable surfaces. And the reason for that is because if it's already impacted, so it's a solid area, you're not disrupting or disturbing the vegetation. Uh, the other thing is dispose of waste properly. So pack it in, pack it out. If you have something with you, trash, uh, toilet paper, anything, whatever goes into the park needs to come out of the park and into a trash can uh, before you leave. Again, it's your park and uh, there is typically 318 million visitors that visit the National Park Service and without people doing their part of collecting their trash and picking up other trash, uh, it wouldn't be as beautiful as it is. So thank you to all the people that do that. And then leave what you find. Um, so rocks, sticks, uh, pine cones, feathers, anything that you find in a national park has to stay in a national park because it's part of the natural landscape. Um, one of the hardest part of my jobs is when young children show me their treasures, their rocks and all the things that they find. So one of the ways that, that I handle that is to 
take that opportunity to teach and then encourage them to take a picture of what they found and then to teach others what they found. And then uh, be consider considerate of, to other visitors. So that means sound. One of the ways to be be considerate of others is to keep the volume down or if you have something, some type of transportation or um, if you're camping and you have a generator go going, be mindful of the times for that because we want everybody to fall in love with their national parks and then also have that experience that uh, of really interacting with nature that we don't always get in our day-to-day -day, uh, lives. So um, if you're interested in being part of the national parks, there's always something for someone. If you go to the website volunteer.gov, you'll find so many opportunities on there, even at different times of the year. So I had said earlier that we have professors that come in and teach us uh, in the winter time during their holidays. Sometimes they'll come in in their summer when they're on breaks. And it's amazing uh, how much they contribute back, but there is a position for everyone. Uh, then lastly, um, I did want to give you the opportunity to, um, does anyone know how many national parks? Oh, wait, did you cheat or anything? Look it up, because I would, I know you're all online. Does anyone know how many national parks? And if you do, I'd love you to type it in or let, let, let us know, but I'll give you the answer. So there's actually 13 national parks uh, in, in Utah. And some people might not know, but national monuments are part of the national park. Um, the outdoor recreational um, parks would be Glen Canyon. A lot of people know that as Powell. Uh, if so, if you've been there, that's part of the national parks. But these are also all our sister parks because they're so close to us here in uh, Utah. We collaborate together all the time. We're always learning. Um, I think that sums it up. I think I've pretty much shared what it's like. And if anyone has questions, I would love your questions. If you are interested in knowing more about the geology, the fascinating geology here at Bryce Canyon, visit our website at nps.gov forward slash BRCA. So Bryce, first two letters, and then Canyon, and any other park that you're interested in. One more little piece for you. If there's any educators out there, any parents or any grandparents that would like to know about this opportunity, is we also do uh, outreaches for education. We go in the classroom. We typically do that. Um, we do it always during the winter, but uh, we also do uh, social, well, we use our tablets and we bring the classroom out with us into the canyon and we'll teach uh, the, the natural resources. So if a teacher is maybe covering uh, earth science or uh, land science or whatever the topic is, we'll work with your curriculum and we will make the match with the environment that we have in front of us. So we do the grand staircase, we do rock formations, we do the animals in the park, whatever the teachers want. And how you find out more about that is you go to the park, any park that you're interested in, and then look for education. There'll also be an email in there. You can email us and uh, we'll, we'll start working on setting dates here in the next, probably in about a month and a half, because classrooms are just really just starting up again. So we'll give uh, teachers a little time and give us a little time to be prepared. And that way we can bring the classroom right to whatever school that is interested in learning that. And we can visit all over the United States. We've, we've been in classrooms in Hawaii and Alaska. Um, yeah, so all over the place, and, and that's one of the jobs that uh, that I love is that we get to be all over the place. So people that wouldn't have accessibility to a national park uh, ha have that opportunity to be with us out there. I'd love to know some questions that you have. I think I've hit my time. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity of being here, and I look forward to seeing you in Bryce.
please look for Ranger Paula when you're there. Uh, tell any of them and because we all know each other in the national parks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paula. That was a wealth of information and so amazing to hear what the huge diversity of what park rangers do. All right, so we are going to dive straight into questions. Some have been submitted to us privately during the time. So some are to specific. Oh, yeah. And so if anyone else is mulling over questions as we start beginning to answer the ones that have been asked, just start putting them into the chat and we will get to as many as we can. And so, yeah, well, here we go. Um, some will be for specific organizations, like, for example, for Swanner, um, or actually this one's going to be for anyone. Does anyone know the difference between like a nature reserve or a state park versus a national park? Like what, what, at what level does it become one or the other or a monument? Cause you were saying that there were 13. And so where does that differentiation come? Well, I can speak for Swanner. So we're, we use conservation easements that are through various organizations like Utah Open Lands, for example. And then I believe USU also holds some of our conservation easements. And then there's some people who, the everyone else here will probably know better than me is what I'm trying to say. But then I think that the, uh, then there's federally owned land and state owned land. And um, I'm not sure if those also operate under easements, but that's how Swanner does more privately owned, I guess, so. So for those who don't know, it's, what's an easement? Uh, the easement's just something that permanently protects the land. So it's something you put in place with an organization and it will just make sure that the land uh, is protected. And there's certain things we have to do to make sure that we're um, staying up to our easement so that we couldn't open up the south side of the preserve for anyone to just roam. We have to keep that intact for, um, the wildlife and everything there. Excellent. And so, yes, Paula, um, parks, state park versus national monument versus national park. The best way to answer that is that we partner actually with, uh, we partner with a, a bunch of entities, uh, federal and state and preservations. We work hand in hand with them. The National Park is under the Department of Interior. So the Department of Interior, unlike the Department of Agriculture, would, which would be for a service, they take care of uh, like the trees and all of the, um, we say, we always say they take care of the things, we take care of all of the things. Uh, that's the easiest way to say that. But we, we are under the guidelines of the federal government and our day-to-day -day operations is staying in line with what our mission is, and that's that mission is to preserve and, and protect. Uh, so we answer to the federal government, uh, and it, we're monitored by what we do, and we report daily uh, to our regions and then also to Washington, D.C. Does that help that? Yes, excellently so. <laughs> and so uh, another question that was submitted to us was, um, for Josh, is it free to walk on the golf courses, um, evening or any time? Yes, during the evening, it is free to walk on the golf courses. I don't recommend walking on the golf courses while people are playing golf. Um, golf balls can come in from anywhere and, uh, a lot of people are driving golf carts to protect from that. So best to do that in the evening. Okay. Good to know. And let's see, um, how many geocaches do you have at Swanner, Emma, and how big are they? Because I know geocaches, at least from personal experience, they can go big or small, but they didn't include that part. But I, I thought anyone who doesn't know geocaches, maybe give them a quick introduction and yeah, just what they could find up there. Yeah, so geocaching is essentially like going out and finding these outdoor treasures um, and you're given clues within a certain location to go find these treasures. And so typically they're in some sort of case um, to protect them. Sometimes they'll be like an Altoids case. Um, we have like a bigger one that it's like it looks like a really big old metal lunchbox. Um, 
And so it can be in any of those containers. And so what you're supposed to do, you're supposed to bring like a little trinket or something that you leave in it, and then you can take one. And there's usually a log you can fill out. Um, and so there are seven caches hidden on the preserve. Um, three of them are south of the I-80, but yeah, like I said, most of them are north um, in the sagebrush section. Um, and so they can be accessed anytime. Um, if you go to our webpage and uh, on the sidebar, you click visit the eco center and then there's a geocaching button that will give you a little bit more information, but definitely worth coming to go on a little geocache journey here if you'd like. Wonderful. Are there any geocaches at, um, in the Salt Lake County, like parks and recreation as a, are there geocaches in the national parks? There most likely are geocaches uh, within county parks. They're not any that we've placed particularly, but that is something that's on my list um, is to put them in every park so that we can have visitors to every park. Awesome. Let's see. So in line with the leave no trace, unfortunately, Articles can't be brought in and left in the National Park. That includes the beautiful rocks that people paint. Um, so that would not be part of uh, the enjoyment, but we have a lot of other fun things. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. That's perfectly understandable. And that's good to know because it does go circle back around and the reasons for it. <laughs> All right, let's see. We only have just a couple extra. Um, I'm not seeing any else in the chat, but like I said, you can send them privately if you want or just put them there. But like I said, we've got about one, two more left. Um, this is just a shout out to anyone, really. Um, do you know if there is a prettier way to get to St. George than I-15? <laughs> so <laughs> might go uh, beyond your scope, but yes. <laughs> well, I think the question needs to be narrowed down a little bit. Which direction are you coming from? So from if you're going from east to west to get to St. George, one of the ways I go through, and I ha if you have an extra hour, is through Zion. So from this side of the state over to St. George, nothing like a cut through through Zion. Awesome. And let's see, is there any others? Um, oh, yes. Let one last one. It's for um, Emma at Swanner. Is, is there a... What is the value of doing analog dams instead of using beavers? Great question. So um, since beavers were kind of removed from our landscape all across the um, uh, North America, and there's, there's still beavers, um, but there's not as many as there used to be, and people often view them as pests, and so they don't want them near their yard because they're going to chew down their trees and everything. Um, so the value of doing the beaver dam analogs creates the environment to hopefully bring beavers back because um, beavers aren't going to go to a place that doesn't have uh, enough running water. Beavers have to have running water because if you've ever seen them walk on land, they're very awkward. They very much thrive in the water. Um, so we're trying to create habitat to encourage um, uh, beavers to move in and so they can populate and do their thing. Um, one neat thing, can't remember if I mentioned it, there is a beaver pond just right off the deck at the Eco Center. They moved in about two years ago and they have changed the entire south side of the Eco Center. It used to not have as much water. Now there's this huge storm water detention pond and their lodge is like right on the back deck. Um, and they have several dams going up and down. Um, and then we also, um, uh, last year after we built some beaver dam analogs, some beavers moved in and actually improved the beaver dam analogs and made them much better. Um, so we love when beavers do that. Um, and then, uh, I don't know if you guys have heard of our partners, they're called Sageland Collaborative. They're an amazing organization. They've worked with the Utah Department of Wildlife Resources, and they've actually done some beaver releases um, throughout the state. Um, not on Swanner yet. I would love to do one because they are so cute. But yeah, we're going to we're going to do the work of the beavers up until we can, you know, bring the beavers back. So great question. OK. Can I also mention that I have seen beavers along the Jordan River Parkway Trail. So they are in Salt Lake County. Yay! And it's something that um, is uh, potentially going to be reintroduced in the Yellow Fork Canyon with the trail system as well. Awesome. 
yay, see, nature's everywhere. And we're, we're friends with the beavers too. <laughs> we would love to have some beavers, but we're not a water park. <laughs> There's no water for the beavers. So we just would love to go visit some, some of them. Maybe we'll come your way. <laughs> Well, thank you guys. I think that was the last of the questions. Um, but are there any last minute thoughts any of you guys have as we wrap up and then we will close out for the evening? I have one uh, little gem that I forgot to mention this Saturday in partnership with the Salt County Arts Department and, and the Planetarium. There's going to be an arts, parks, and Utah Sky event all Saturday long. We have at Taylorsville Recreation Center from 10 to 12 uh, activities making a sundial and there's a new sundial art exhibit. At Pleasant Green Park from 1 to 3, there's a nightlife installation and star origami and sun telescopes will be available. And at Yellow Fort Canyon Trailhead from 4 to 6, there's going to be an installation there as well and activities include tin can constellation lanterns and constellation stories. That sounds awesome. All right, Emma, Paula, do you have any thoughts? And if not, that's fine. Thank you for, for letting us get together and all this fun stuff to, to know. Um, yeah, same here. It was a joy learning more about Salt Lake County and Bryce um Bryce Canyon and I'm just excited to get out and explore with all this new knowledge thank you guys so much for being a part of it and being our experts and thank you guys for attending and we hope to see you all again sometime soon so have a good evening everyone